All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Standard. <clears throat> I'm um, one of the creators of Aka.net and in the sort of .NET and technology space. That's kind of what I'm known for. Uh, this talk will mention it, but it's not really about that. It's about software architecture and some lessons that I've learned over the years, primarily by doing things wrong. Um, so we're going to talk about what I think is essentially a, a style of, well, not really a style, but more like a philosophy of software architecture that will save you a lot of time, agony, and most importantly, money and risk down the road. So what is technical debt? Well, technical debt is essentially when you have a baked in, um, let's say, architectural choice made early on in the life cycle of a project. It doesn't necessarily have to be software. Uh, if anyone's tried installing Cat5 in a really old house, you know what technical debt is like in, a, in the physical world. Um, the idea behind this is that if we go ahead and build, let's say, a large-scale piece of enterprise software, could be a line of business application, could be something that's customer-facing, uh, all of them end up kind of in the same place, which is that, let's say you go ahead and build a database-driven application, which is probably the most common style of software application that's out there. You have your relational database that has data, that has table schema, that has stored procedures and views. And then on top of that, you go ahead and have, let's say, your reporting and your object relational mapping. And then you might have your UI layer. Then you have your business processes that either your customers or your internal stakeholders use. And then on top of that, you have all the historical data business value and, let's say, built-in systems like human-run systems and expectations all resting on top of that. So if you want to make a significant change down here, that is going to propagate all the way up through all the layers sitting on top of it. That is the essence of technical debt. So if you wanted to do something like take a stored procedure that is 2,000 lines long, and before you laugh and say, that's unbelievable, uh, no, it's very believable, and happens way more often than you think, and probably involves horrible stuff like CLR data types and things like that. So if you want to make a change down there, you have to find a way to essentially price that change in to all the layers above it. And that is technical debt. And that's where the expense really comes from. It's the layering of basically additional layers on top of lower ones, right? So technical debt, when you are beginning with a greenfield project, it's like a newborn baby. It's totally innocent, doesn't have any history, and has, is nothing but pure potential, right? That's sort of our, our clean slate that we're starting with. Well, when you start making architectural choices really early on in the project, that is where technical debt is going to be born initially. It begins right there. Um, interest, to kind of use a financial analogy here, interest on your technical debt occurs in the form of layering. So if I make one dis technical decision very early on in the life cycle of a project, let's say it's the decision to... Uh, build for, let's say we take this back 10, 15 years ago, and I decide to build my e-commerce system on top of .NET Framework. Well, that also means that I've made a decision to uh, keep my art infrastructure married to Windows. It means that all my developers need to buy Visual Studio subscriptions, and it means that we're probably going to be, you know, um, not able to... Uh, this is all different now, of course, these days, but back then, those are some of the types of technical debt that would accrue, and, you know, other ways that could potentially compound in the future is in the form of, let's say, unknown or unanticipated events that arrive. A good example I remember really clearly of, let's say, unanticipated technical debt with the .NET platform was back in around 2010, 2011, WebSockets first emerged on the scene. And this is when Node.js was first taking off and kind of becoming a, a popular uh, alternative to Ruby and ASP.NET and other technologies. And one of the things that helped Node.js really take off was it had by far and away the best WebSocket support out of any platform that existed at the time. Well, us .NET developers were thinking, wow, we would love to have all those same benefits of server push, but guess what? Because our infrastructure is married to Windows, in order for us to get WebSocket support, we actually had to wait for a Windows server patch to get released. And that also required us to get an IIS patch which required us to also update the version of .NET Framework we were using and required us to update the version of ASP.NET. And you can kind of see, that's an example of an unanticipated change and just something that kind of got priced in. It's still technical debt nonetheless. 
The purpose of this talk, though, is to talk about technical debt you can anticipate. Some new technology coming out of left field in the browser space and, having, and not knowing necessarily how closely your web stack was married to your operating system. Okay, that's not your fault. But the failure to account for problems you can easily see coming down the road two, five, ten years in the future, that is something that you as an architect need to price into your designs sooner rather than later. And that's really kind of the essence of optionality. Technical debt, its full amount is kind of expressed at the time you have to make a change. If you have to do something like migrate from .NET Framework to .NET 6, you're not going to know what the full cost of that is until you start getting into the weeds and doing it. Right? It's not very easy to predict ahead of time. What we're going to talk about today is this is a concept that originally is kind of in, in finance. It's known as optionality. Uh, stock options or futures contracts are a really good examples of optionality where someone can purchase a call option. It's a right to buy a stock at a fixed price at some future point in time. Call options are really useful if you think that the value of a stock is going to go up at some point in the future. Or, you know, I'm from Houston. This is like the energy capital of the United States. Um, people buy oil futures for different types of petroleum products, and they do that in order to try to keep their costs down. They basically know I'm going to be paying $100 a barrel for a price of oil uh, at you know, some point in the next 12 months, and if the price of oil goes beyond that, I save a whole bunch of money that way. So the idea is that I pay a premium today, I have to put in some money now to get that future, and then I have the right to exercise it at, you know, basically up until the option contract expires. In terms of software with optionality, we pay for optionality by planning ahead, and we exercise when we know that our business and our software need to adjust accordingly in order to meet some business goal. So I'll give you an example here in terms of optionality. The further you are outside the circle, the more optionality you have. In a green field project, you have nothing but options. No code is yet written, no infrastructure is yet picked, unless you have an IT department that's dogmatic, which some of us have. But no infrastructure is picked, there's no schema, there's no customer data. Uh, all we have are our requirements and, the set of, and basically our experience. That's the only real thing you're kind of bringing into that project, right? Well. Once you start moving further down, let's say you get a new product that has uh, only a few users, you still have a lot more options for how you can make changes to that product than you do if you're in this middle circle right here, which is where you have a mission critical product. You know, so for example, uh, some of my customers at Petabridge, and these are all people building large scale event driven applications. Some of their products are responsible for I've got one customer that basically has a manufacturing line that is worth probably close to, let's say, $50 billion on there. And it's all being automated by Aka.net and a bunch of other pieces of technology. They do not have a huge amount of options for how they want to change that because they have to roll it out to a bunch of factories and they have to change all their business procedures, not to mention the amount of disruption it would cause if they did that. So that's an example of a product that doesn't have a lot of options unless the developers built them into their architecture, which is what we're going to talk about. So the big idea behind optionality is that when you're starting here with a greenfield project and you don't have any constraints, it's to plan ahead for how your business might possibly change in the future and being able to go ahead and pay a little bit of premium now in order to make sure that adjusting to those new business realities isn't a tremendously expensive project later, right? So technical debt is basically the destruction of optionality is what that really is where if I have a whole bunch of customer data and a bunch of business processes and a bunch of built-in knowledge from, let's say, you know, if you're running an insurance business, all of the claims adjusters know how to use your internal software today. If you want to radically change that, you have to retrain all of them. That's it's not as simple as just a software problem anymore. It's a big business issue. So the technical debt that we incur typically happens when we fail to plan for how software might evolve in the future. And I'm going to give you some examples of that from my own personal experience in just a second. Um, a really good example of like a rapid fire technical debt accumulation tool is database driven development. And the reason why is that unless you are really confident your requirements aren't going to change, or you have made a really simple schema that's very fast and very flexible, you're going to basically be bound by whatever the development constraints are of that database. 
For a lot of applications, that will never realistically be an issue because maybe they're auxiliary systems that don't get changed very often. Maybe they're very low traffic or maybe they're in an area of your business that's fairly stable and you're not anticipating a lot of change in the future. However, if you're from startup world like I am, where you're launching, let's say, new products and you're not totally sure what product market fit looks like, meaning that your business is probably going to adjust a bit over the next couple of years, this can be a disaster in the making, and that is exactly what happened to me, and we'll get into that in the next slide. Ah, uh, these are some of my favorite Twitter fights I get into about once a quarter. Um, whoever needs to switch databases? Quick show of hands in this room, who has ever switched a database before in a production system? Okay, the few and the proud, thank you. Um, switching databases should be rare. If you find yourself switching databases every year, please fire your architect. Um, but there are cases where that has to be a viable solution. And a lot of the times, the reason why people get into the whoever needs to switch databases camp is because they've painted themselves into a corner where switching databases is never a feasible option. In other words, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that you should never have to switch databases, you never, make the, you never create the options where that is even viable. Um, on top of that, things like the repository pattern gets bashed all the time, probably because people try to make a repository like a one-size-fits-all thing. That's not a great idea. But abstracting your data access layer behind some common abstraction, uh, both that's sort of, let's say, tailored to a specific domain and very narrowly scoped, actually can be really valuable as a form of creating optionality. And that'll come up in my example. The basic idea behind this is that future technical debt can be mitigated by making some architectural choices today. So I'm going to use an example from my last company, Marked Up. Uh, we did real-time analytics and marketing automation for developers who are building apps for the Windows Store, so Windows 8, Windows Phone, and eventually uh, Win32 desktop applications. So we were a real-time analytics startup. Um, we originally, this is like 2000, yeah, 2012. We originally built our minimum viable product, so our first go-to-market solution, on top of RavenDB using their MapReduce indices. Uh, these worked great for doing real-time analytics. And I had read Allende's blog post basically knocking the repository pattern and calling it an anti-pattern, you shouldn't use it, blah, blah, blah. So I, I bought in on that, you know, hook, line, and sinker, and basically went and uh, had RavenDB calls everywhere in our system, in our write pipeline, in our reporting system, in our user registration system. Uh, we basically said, you know, why bother having a repository? Allende is right. This is, you know, going to be a, a way to make sure we don't have unnecessary abstractions inside our system. Well, as I mentioned down here, um, we were way more successful with our early customer acquisition efforts than I thought. We went from about... 10,000 events per day just in our analytics system to about five to eight million events per day in the span of a three-day window. So that's like a, what, 400% uh, like day-over-day day increase for three days in a row. And the amount of traffic that we are producing should have been something that RavenDB could handle, but alas, it could not. As a result of some of our architecture decisions, uh, our database logic was spread out everywhere and RavenDB could not basically keep our reports up to date. And this was during a critical window where we were raising venture capital money and trying to basically prove to the market that we had a viable solution. So I was staying up until you know, 4 o'clock in the morning and getting up at 10 a.m. the following day for about three weeks, trying to basically furiously pay off this technical debt so we could successfully complete our fundraise and not lay everybody off. So the real risk here was because we hadn't taken, made any effort to isolate our database decision away from the rest of our domain logic around transforming events, managing customer data, and so forth, and we had also depended on a RavenDB-specific feature, these MapReduce indices, both of those choices coupled us very tightly to our database, and there was nothing we could do to make Raven scale. We even wrote our own replication system and our own database migration system because Raven's built-in tooling utterly failed at both. So we threw everything we could at that, and we had, a, uh, I think, a 64-core database instance trying to go ahead and process all this. And if I showed you the graph, what we basically saw was CPU utilization at 100%, disk utilization at 100%, memory at like 1 12th the amount it should be using. It basically wasn't using memory very efficiently. 
So this created a really high risk situation for our business. And we had to basically do an emergency migration off of RavenDB to something more scalable. Otherwise, our business would fail and we would not be able to successfully complete our fundraise. So here's what we did. In the span of about yeah, three to four weeks, we refactored our system uh, to an event-driven processing model, is what we did. And I created a piece of middleware that could take all of the events the clients were sending to our HTTP API. That was another form of technical debt, but in this case, it didn't really affect us too bad. Uh, we had to make sure the same events that were already embedded in those apps could get reprocessed in a new system and produce the same reports. So we created some middleware that could translate those events into an analytic delta. Uh, basically, it's a, a sort of a way of incrementing a counter without knowing what its full value is. And we separated our read and write models into discrete services that were abstracted away, essentially repositories. Uh, well, services plus repositories internally. Um, the other thing that we couldn't really do very well with our original implementation is because we were so closely married to our database, we didn't really have the ability to unit test. We had to integration test everything with the RavenDB local instance up and running, which, all, again, made it very difficult for us to start making this change, trying to move towards a database system that'd be more scalable. So we were able to add unit tests back because we had effectively abstracted away our persistence layer now. Um, we created a little DSL that allowed dynamic per user filtering of events, that was super useful, and greatly improved our developer throughput. Uh, the database we switched to, in case someone's at wondering, is Apache Cassandra, which is a big, super write-heavy system that's great at real-time analytics. And we were able to replace most of Raven's functionality. Uh, there were a couple things we couldn't really do uh, that we had to defer for a basically another project in a future day. But this helped us quite a bit and allowed us to get past these scaling challenges and just scale horizontally going forward. So what did we do differently here? Well, basically, we decided that, you know what, we're not going to repeat the same mistake of putting all our eggs in one basket with one database solution. Um, when we eventually would reach a scale, we were doing about 100 million events today from millions of concurrent users in the span of like a three hour window in the US. So, uh, thankfully, Cassandra was able to scale with that, but we were hedging our bets that, you know what, if, it, if Cassandra started having problems and we started reaching the 100 million, billion, you know, sort of area, we wanted to have the ability to move to something else if we needed to. That became a valuable option for us, given the types of scaling issues we were dealing with. On top of that, we really wanted to have unit testing and kind of keep our business logic around computing deltas completely isolated from the database. The real issue here is that software developers, in terms of what the modern consensus is around software design, is you ain't gonna need it. Build for your requirements today. Anything with regard to future requirements is tomorrow you's problem, right? Future you, they can figure it out. Well, that is a really catastrophically stupid decision in a lot of cases. And the reason why is that Yagni comes with an expiration date. You are, it really should be, you are eventually going to need it, probably. Good example. If I'm launching an e-commerce startup and I go ahead and marry all of my business processes and designs to, let's say, Stripe for doing my credit card processing and subscriptions, that's probably fine for the first several years of my startup's business, right? But if at some point in the future I want to expand into India or other countries where Stripe isn't the best processor or there's a local processor that works better, or if I want to try to switch to a different processor to reduce my charge fees so I can actually get more profit per transaction, if I'm totally married to Stripe and everything in my API and in my data system is all Stripe-centric, that is going to be an enormously expensive project down the road. Whereas if I design my payment processor system to be inherently pluggable from day one, that becomes a much more achievable project in the future, adding a new payment provider to service customers in this geography, or, add, or replacing Stripe for new customers in the future to lower my credit card fees. And that's a requirement you can easily anticipate if you're going into that business. That you know what, there'll be some point when the business asks us to support a new credit card processor, that's inevitable in any sort of you know, e-commerce customer facing business. We need to build in the option to do that when we're first getting started, not engage in a giant you know, emergency fire drill, sort of uh, hair on fire exercise like we did at Marked Up. So let's talk about high optionality programming. 
What are some techniques that will, generally speaking, preserve optionality a lot better than things like CRUD, for instance? CRUD does not really preserve optionality. So what are some techniques that will help us do that? Well, this isn't a exhaustive list. These are the big ones that, in my personal experience, have helped me a lot. And any project where I did not start with this, I eventually ended up there through an expensive refactoring exercise that I'm trying to help you avoid. So, event-driven programming is probably the dominant one, followed by event sourcing, CQRS, actors, naturally, and extend-only design. Let's talk about event-driven programming first and how that preserves optionality. Well, if I have, let's say, a traditional RPC service, let's say an HTTP API, or you know, uh, maybe some, most types of gRPC services, I basically send a request and I get a response back from the same server I was talking to. And you know, that's run of the mill web application development. With an event driven system, I have a lot more inherent flexibility in the communication models between my client and my server than I do with an RPC system. With RPC, you're essentially limited to request response. That's the communication pattern that you get. Uh, maybe you could also do one way on there. You could do fire and forget messaging by just returning a HTTP response before you do any processing. But it's all, in essence, request response. With an event-driven system, you have a lot more different possible messaging patterns out there than merely request response. For example, down here, this is what a publish and subscribe messaging pattern might look like. You have a client sends one message to the server, and it can get a, a infinite stream of responses as things happen in real time later. And the technology you could use to implement this is pretty diverse. You could use in service bus, you could use Akka.net, you could use Orleans, or you could use something like gRPC to do that if you wanted to. So I have a lot more choices around how things work with an inherently event-driven system. It gives me more possible patterns and tools to leverage than a simple RPC system does. Now, the idea behind events, let me pause here for a second. Yeah, there we go. The idea behind events, there we go, is that in essence, um, they have additional properties beyond, let's say, just the simple payload. So you do have the payload, that's your data, but you also usually have a reply to address. Now that can be explicitly exposed, like it would be in a Akka.net system, but it might also be implicit via something like RabbitMQ where you might have a reply to channel on there and you don't necessarily know who's listening to it. Um, that's sort of the, the first bit. Messaging and event-driven systems are almost always asynchronous. Uh, so when you go ahead and pass an event somewhere, you might be given a task you can A, wait on, uh, if you want to do request, uh, request response style over a message-driven system, but you don't have to. Um, most often, these systems tend to be pretty fire and forget. I write a message in a RabbitMQ, I get an acknowledgement that the message is queued, and then I don't worry about who's processing it. I move on and go back to the rest of my work. Um, that gives us a lot of flexibility around how processing is done, and most importantly, with messaging is that the messages are always stored and serialized. So there's actually a real object you can point to that correlates to this request. An HTTP request is a transient in-flight object that has a real time limit associated with it. That's your timeout value, right? Well, with messaging, you're a little bit more flexible. You have this serialized message body and it can be processed immediately if you have, let's say, a bunch of competing consumers all trying to drain a queue or it could be processed over and over again in the future if you have a tool like Apache Kafka where you have arbitrary clients and arbitrary groups that read partitions over and over again. Um, it's a lot more flexible than what an RPC system can do. On top of that, message-oriented systems have the ability to change the order in which requests are processed. In a you know, HTTP or RPC system, everything's gotta be processed live right now. You don't necessarily have the ability to reorder uh, how those HTTP requests are processed. In a message-driven system, this is really trivial. The recipient of the message can say, okay, before I process this message, I need to wait for this one to arrive, because that has the data I need in order to process this request. And this is what we would call a deferral in a message processing system. In a tool like Akka.net, you would use behavior switching and stashing to do that. And then the most powerful property of an event-driven system is that events can be forwarded, delegated, or even broadcast to multiple parties. You can't do that with a request or with a function call. 
Uh, so the fact that you have this artifact, this message that has possibly a unique ID, it can be serialized into a byte array, and it can be shared across multiple parties, is an inherently more flexible programming model than what a you know, purely procedural sort of you know, application is going to look like. And so in terms of the interaction patterns for a message-driven system, these are going to be inherently more diverse than what you get with RPC. I can have a broadcast interaction where one party publishes its message to many receivers. This opens the door for all sorts of interesting communication patterns in a you know, distributed system. I can do a proxy pattern. This is basically how you delegate work inside an event-driven system, where I can hand off the responsibility for processing a message from one party to another if I want to. And then we also have relationships like publish and subscribe, where I can kind of invert control and the client basically receives notifications from the server when state changes, rather than the client having to pull the server for those changes you know, repeatedly down the road. So the first sort of tool we're going to use for kind of limiting our technical debt accumulation, there we go, and yeah, one-way messaging. The first tool, it, the first kind of stop is using an event-driven architecture. Um, generally speaking, Event-driven architectures scale really well with domain complexity, and they buy you a lot more freedom in the future if you need to change how processing is done. A procedural system is going to be much harder to adjust uh, because it's not inherently flexible in the same way that this is. The other reason why we want to look at event-driven architectures is it lends itself really well to the second, third, and fourth patterns, which is event sourcing. Why does event sourcing help us mitigate technical debt? Well, this is how like Akadot persistence works, for instance, where we go ahead and we process messages in the order in which we receive them initially for a single actor. And a single actor represents like one business entity inside our system. So if I'm keeping track of, let's say, um, session state for a user, and I want to see what sorts of things uh, that user might be looking at on our e-commerce site so I can try to personalize a recommendation for them in real time, I might be receiving a stream of click events here inside that actor for that user. And I have an in-memory representation of that user's click stream, right? Well, every single time we go and communicate with that actor, that actor has an in-memory copy of that state, but that state is also being event sourced, one clickstream event at a time to whatever our database is. And our database could be SQL, could be Azure Table Storage. It's not really relevant. It all kind of looks like a key value store inside this system. Now, how does this go and preserve optionality for us versus, let's say, just writing rows or modifying, object, modifying a document in MongoDB or inserting a row into SQL? Well, yep, this is how we'd go and replay it. The reason why is that event sourcing inherently lends itself to providing a complete history of how something changed. It gives us the ability to see that the user did this, did that, did that, and that, and that leads to their current state, whatever that is right now. That state could be a recommendation for what sorts of products we should show that user. That state could be the account balance for a bank account. That state could be the current state of a device operating a process line control system in a factory doesn't really necessarily matter. It works for any domain. But the state can always be rebuilt by replaying previous events. This means that your current state, the current application state of your objects, is something that you can reprogram on the fly without having to touch your data if you want to. If you want to make an update to the code that reconstitutes your state, it's really easy to do that because it is effectively separate from the data. The data is all those past events. They're immutable, they are at rest inside your database somewhere, and you can't change what they mean, right? But you can go ahead and change how you basically constitute those events in order to represent the state of your object. So a good example, if we change the types of, let's say, um, types of bank accounts that we support in our banking system, and I want to have the ability to show pending transactions and pending account balances as separately from the posted balance, I could reasonably do that by adding a new event type that represents pending operations and replaying all my old types. And I'll have in one section the current balance and then the pending balance. And that doesn't require me to do a dangerous data migration or anything else at all. Because all those old events that represent the user's account history are still there inside the database. So the way the state is built can be changed without changing the events themselves. That is a very powerful option. Another powerful option, again, I'll use a financial example, is that 
Historical events can be replayed and reused in new forms aside from what your application does. You can use them for things like simulations or predictions, or you can even use them for validating uh, a future version of the application, for instance. One of the ways they do testing of really complex pieces of software, like massively multiplayer online RPGs, is by replaying a saved game over the new client. The reason why is it's not possible to go ahead and write unit tests for every possible interaction that can happen between players. So you wanna go and take all of the different, let's say, events that occurred over the course of a game session and replay them through the new client and look for unanticipated changes, regressions that might occur there. Really easy to do that with an event source system. Uh, we use this for regression testing future versions of uh, Marked Up, actually. We use it for doing a combination of load testing and also making sure that our analytics system work correctly. These same events with the new code should still produce the same uh, total values as the old one. Lastly, another option that event sourcing gives us is the ability to safely introduce new event types without modifying existing data. The immutability of existing customer and business data is actually a really important selling point from the riskiness of a system. How many of you have had a automated database migration go wrong in a production system before? Let's all be honest. Uh, it can happen. And that's basically as a result of the fact that you're changing an object in a way that is not intrinsically safe is what's going on there. You're doing uh, some sort of destructive action against your schema migration, potentially. We're gonna address how to manage that issue in the final section, which is extend-only design. We'll get to that in a moment. But event sourcing naturally lends itself to that type of extension as well. The other sort of thing that's inherently useful about event sourcing is that typically it relies on really simple key value store architectures. This means that you can actually use event sourcing with pretty much any database out there. Even something really simple like Azure Table Storage will work fine. So you're not basically using um, super, let's say, bespoke database features that don't translate very well to another database in the event that you needed to migrate in the future. And honestly, something that's pretty simple and robust like Postgres will probably scale just fine for a really large event source system. Because again, we're using really simple constructs. There's no left outer joins against synthetic tables in here, right? Now the next pattern that we're gonna get to, and these all kind of uh, compile on top of each other, is CQRS, Command and Query Responsibility Segregation. The idea behind this, if you're not familiar with CQRS, is basically to separate your read and write models from each other. Uh, one mistake that a lot of developers often make is having their read and write models be the exact same thing. And the reason why that doesn't work is the way there's impedance mismatch, but the other potential issue with it is, is that uh, certain databases are faster at performing reads than they are at performing writes. And if your system becomes increasingly write heavy, uh, trying to have reads and writes use the same model is going to create a lot of inherent friction and tension inside the system. So the idea behind this is essentially, your write models should be optimized for writes, your read models should be optimized for reads. Now you have a lot of flexibility on how you produce a read model from your writes. That's uh, something you could do inside your application. It's something you could do with a database feature, like a, like a view, if you wanted to, a materialized view. But the basic gist behind this is that you should optimize your models separately. So in the case of, let's say, our event source system, it's optimized for super fast, super simple writes that can be done at high rates of speed. Even in a relational database like SQL Server, which is traditionally a little bit slower at handling writes than something like MongoDB or Redis, perhaps. But with our read models, we can go ahead and build something that's a lot richer and a lot closer to the type of requirements your business users might actually want. So if you wanna have a really nice reporting system, or you wanna go ahead and use you know, SQL Server analysis services to produce a nice data cube, your read models are what really handle that. And they are kept separate from your write models. And usually you have a processor that will go ahead and either materialize the, uh, the read view at the time, the, shortly after the write occurs, or you might use a database feature to go and do that potentially. The, uh, the real big benefit from an optionality point of view here is that you can always change your read models independently from the data that's at rest. You can always essentially rerun your projection process and recreate those on the fly. There's synthetic data, in other words, right? The thing we're trying to avoid doing with event sourcing and CQRS is taking the valuable business data we've already recorded and touching it in a potentially destructive way. That's what we're trying to avoid from a business risk perspective. 
CQRS helps us do that by making sure that all of our read models can essentially be reproduced on the fly when we need to. Because all of the data that was written is still there, and it's not inherently modified as part of our projection process here. The next option that we get for out of this is that the performance characteristics for read and write models can be tuned separately if you need to. We might need to have a super efficient write model for being able to handle lots of, you know, let's say millions of operations per second potentially. But our read model needs to be optimized for maybe being able to take a fairly large amount of data and compress it into a really small HTTP response size or a really small analytic delta we serve up over signal R, something like that you have the ability to kind of performance tune each of these individually, which is really useful. On top of that, not just tuning the performance, but also tuning how human friendly they are. Your write model should probably be machine friendly if you care about performance. If you care about not getting fired, your read model should be human friendly. That makes sense? All right. And then, yeah, on top of that, you can actually potentially use separate databases for reads and writes if you want to. A good example of that, uh, we had a customer that does uh, really super detailed financial reporting for like government compliance. And they use basically an event source system on top of Postgres for doing all of their uh, inbound, uh, inbound writes. And we used basically kind of a, don't hate me for this, we use an entity framework sort of schema for actually going and producing the real reports auditors would use inside their system. And that was done all on top of Postgres as well, but I could very easily have done that on SQL Server if I needed to. There would have been very little cost to doing that. The last thing I'd go ahead and mention as far as the event, as the sort of event-driven part is actors. Actors are dynamic and they give you the ability to kind of partition how you process streams of events that are inside your system. So for instance, I can go ahead and have one actor per business entity that's being updated in real time. I can have stateless actors that perform tasks like sending transactional emails or writing to the database or calling a web API. Uh, they're inherently flexible pieces of code that are designed to be run in parallel with lots of other instances of themselves in order to achieve maximum throughput and CPU utilization. Well, what makes actors useful from an optionality standpoint is their dynamism. It's the fact that we can basically change where work is happening and how work is done on the fly as we're receiving events in real time. This is what a simple Akadana actor looks like, for instance. We have a little base type, this receive actor. And then we have some state. In this case, my state is just our logging system handle. And then we have the different types of message handlers that we're processing. And these messages are, are, can be sent in memory or they can be sent over the network. Aka.net doesn't care and that's kind of invisible to you as the end user. And then you have some C-sharp code or F-sharp code uh, optionally in here for being able to do processing. And in this case, I'm scheduling a delayed reply back to the sender here. If I just called sender.tell, I'd be replying to them back in real time. One of the things that this actor can do, yeah, I'll skip this part. One of the things that actors can inherently do is change their behavior at runtime as they're processing a message. I can say, instead of processing, we'll go back here, instead of processing this ping message using this function, change to using this function instead until we get this critical event that we're waiting for. So imagine building something like a state machine for some part of your business. Uh, if you're doing something like transactional processing for an e-commerce system, you might say, okay, the first thing we need to do is submit the payment information to our payment gateway and see if that result comes back successfully. If that result doesn't come back successfully, we have a whole error flow we need to go through where we let the user know why their card was declined. We probably have to send them an email. We probably still have to preserve everything in their cart. Uh, or maybe we might schedule a quick retry to see if it goes through a second time, right? whatever the case may be. And if the uh, credit card transaction goes through successfully, then we have a fulfillment process the actor's gonna start running through, where we might talk to our fulfillment server and make sure that there is a entry for getting this product loaded into our shipping uh, partner and getting that out the door. And actors can basically switch behavior really quickly with a very minimal amount of code uh, in order to handle these types of cases. This is a lot simpler because it's all self-contained inside one object that owns this unit of work that it is trying to coordinate that across a whole bunch of different microservices or a whole bunch of different procedural classes that are all spread out. Uh, 
So the ability for us to kind of dynamically shift how we do processing in real time is very powerful. It gives us the ability to compress what could be an enormous amount of business logic into a relatively small amount of code. So actors and optionality. Well, one of the things they also make possible is the ability to query your live application state at runtime if you want to. If I want to basically know what is the total amount of orders that are being processed right now, that is very trivial to implement with actors. Doing that with database-driven development would probably require you to maintain a whole separate set of calls to Redis where you need to keep update or increment a counter, uh, decrement it, then you have to go ahead and basically add an error handling and retrying if that query doesn't go through. Whereas with actors, you can just run a quick, um, there's actually a number that gets exposed in Akka.net you can just pull to see how many actors are alive right now. It also makes stateful server-side applications viable. Uh, one of my biggest complaints about database-driven development is it's inherently stateless, all of it, which is fine for probably, I'd say, the vast majority of applications, but the most critical ones in your business will often need to have some measure of state in order to do things like keep request uh, processing times low. If you want to build an application that can build, let's say, something like a real-time uh, banner ad exchange or a real-time chat system or a real-time, you know, let's say, fleet management system, uh, you need state inside your application to make that achievable. Actors are a pitch-perfect way of doing that inside your system. Whether you use Akka.net or Orleans doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just the general paradigm is really useful at giving you that set of tools to do it. The other thing is that, like we talked about, event processing can become dynamic. Rather than having a static set of functions that are inherently stateless handling our business logic and our work, we have entities that are responsible for recovering their own state, making decisions about what to do with events in real time based on what their state is, and they have the ability to dynamically do things like reroute a message somewhere else, stash it and process it later once we get a critical event that arrives, or broadcast it to multiple parties over our network. All these different event-driven paradigms we discussed earlier are all very inexpensive to implement with actors and don't require very much infrastructure either. Um, the other thing is that actors have the ability to basically be distributed over a network with, very, with essentially no code changes. Um, actors tend to be location transparent, which means that if an actor moves from one process onto another as a result of, let's say, the other process being shut down, that's not going to have a tremendous amount of impact on your code. That's a routine thing actors can handle. It's just like you know, basically if you were uh, to rebalance a Kafka partition or add a new web server under your load balancer. It's more or less the same sort of automated process for doing that. The last subject I'll touch on for being able to preserve optionality is what we call extend-only design. Now I have a full blog post that goes into a lot more detail on how to do this on my personal website, and I'll talk about that at the end. But if you're doing database-driven development, this is the one pattern you can implement today that will help you a lot in terms of preserving optionality in your system. This does not require you to do an event-driven architecture. This does not require you to use actors. You can do this with SQL Server today. Extendably design is a methodology for making sure that there are no incompatible changes ever made to your SQL schema at any point in the present moving forward. It's basically a way of preserving backwards and forwards compatibility. The idea is that your schema, your wire format, so if you're doing serialization, that's what we're referring to there, and APIs are frozen for updates or deletes. If you want to make a change to your HTTP endpoint, you're going to have to either introduce a new method or you're going to need to introduce a new version where that has a separate URI prefix than what you had before, which is basically how people version public web APIs typically. So no destructive changes are allowed. You're not allowed to change how something worked you're not allowed to rename or repurpose something. You're not allowed to delete stuff. Anything that is being used by live stakeholders or being used by live clients stays frozen as is. New things can always be added. This is the extension part. You can always add new stuff that wasn't being used before. You can add a new HTTP endpoint. You can add a new message type to your event source system. You can add a new table. You can add a new column to an existing table. You just can't go back and change the past. You can't basically change something that's currently being used or currently has data in it that you know will be used. So old schema will be gradually made obsolete as the software updates. If we have some old SQL schema that we want to get rid of, 
We can't delete it, but we can gradually stop using it, and then maybe we could go back and delete it if we wanted to. But that process takes a little while. You have to kind of age it out of your system. So why is Extend Only Design useful? It eliminates an entire risk category for updating your software in the future and an entire area where technical debt cr gets created. The accidental destruction of business value. And on top of that, the unknown unknowns of, gee, what happens if I go through and change the schema on this table? How many different calls are there to that table that I can't trace inside all the various applications that talk to it? That's something that can be, to a degree, unknowable inside your application. Therefore, it's risky to make those destructive changes. With extend-only design, you avoid that entire problem because you're not fundamentally changing the stuff that's already in use. You're just adding new things that updated clients and updated consumers will use down the road. So a good example of like how we manage versioning in like Akka.net's internal message formats, uh, we use Google Protobuf for all of our internal message types. And Protobuf lends it really well to this type of extend-only design. So for instance, I might have a little protobuf message that looks like this, where, okay, uh, I've got these five properties here, and I want to add a sixth property for figuring out if this user uh, made this type of stock trading operation, an ask. I want to see if this person uh, did this ask using margin, meaning they borrowed money from us in order to buy that stock. Uh, okay, did this person make this, actually not to buy the stock, to sell it in this case, so they might be shorting or something. So this is a new field. This new field can be added to this protobuf message, and that protobuf message can be recompiled into C Sharp without breaking wire compatibility. If I go and I'm running this node in the cluster using this new version of the message, all the older nodes that don't have that definition for that field will see some unrecognized property and just ignore it. Now, that's not great from a data loss standpoint, but it's a lot better than the alternative, which might be bricking the rest of the entire cluster as soon as that first node joins, right? So this ability to extend, this extend only design ability gives us both forward and backwards compatibility. In the backwards direction, if my new client gets an old message from one of the old node types, it can substitute a default value for that new optional property. Okay, if I'm getting a trade order from an old client that doesn't support margin, guess what? That trade can't be done with margin. Therefore, we're going to say that property is false inside our application. Our serializer will go ahead and just use a safe default value there. Uh, if you're building something like an um, extend-only design with SQL schema, you might have a default value you specify for, for basically pre for rows that didn't have that new column you're adding. So it might be null, might be a good example. Or maybe if you're using an integer, the value is 0 or negative 1. Whatever kind of makes sense for your use case. But the idea behind this is that by using extend-only design, we preserve our old schema, and we don't have to account for all of the different parts of our application that might be talking to it. We can go ahead and add the new functionality we need without destroying the old functionality that other clients might use. And because the new client knows how to substitute a safe default value for areas where that new data may not be available, old clients and new clients can continue to interact with each other safely over a longer period of time. On top of that, this also means you can actually update your database schema independently from your application. I can roll out my schema update well in advance of the application that uses it. So I don't have to have an entity framework migration running live in my CI CD pipeline. Our DBAs can stage it, execute it, see it roll out, and then the application can get deployed you know, that day or the following day if you want to. It effectively decouples those two activities together and lowers the risk of a deployment failing or of customer and business data being destroyed. Uh, yeah. On top of that, extend-only design is a great way to guarantee zero downtime deployments. Um, I imagine that a lot of you have the ability to take your systems offline and have downtime when you do a really big deployment. But if you work in industries like software as a service or maybe doing things like uh, you know, manufacturing, you want to try to avoid downtime to the extent that is possible because that represents a business outage and lost revenue and potentially mad customers. Extend-only design is an absolute must-have if that's important to you, being able to essentially eliminate downtime in your deployments. So extend-only extend only design will help you tremendously. Now, what do these patterns all have in common, these high optionality patterns? What's the essence of this programming methodology? Well, immutability is probably the foremost concern here, which is that once state is, is written somewhere, 
it can't, its meaning can't be changed and it can't be destroyed unless you're being really intentional about it. No accidental side effects on data is what we're trying to avoid here. So immutability kind of sits at the forefront of all these patterns. It's all about trying to conserve the, basically the old datum in perpetuity for future use. We're basically assuming data storage is cheap and honestly compared to software development time, it really is. So we're more than happy to go ahead and trade a larger SQL Server instance in exchange for our developers not having to spend hundreds of man years you know, rewriting a piece of production code. Dynamism is another thing that we're trying to preserve here. Uh, we want to go ahead and dynamically route, process, and react to state changes in real time. Systems that are more static are inherently less flexible and require a lot more effort on the part of the developer to update. Uh, systems that are inherently dynamic from the get-go, like event-driven architectures or actors, are going to be easier to do on kind of an ad hoc basis over time. And lastly, we kind of separated our concerns to some degree. Each of these patterns kind of addresses different facets of software. Actors are all about how we process the system. Events are all about how we organize interactions between domains. Event sourcing is how we write. CQRS is how we read, et cetera. Uh, these are all different sort of facets of our, of our application programming models. But when we put them all together, we end up with a system that's going to make be easier to change down the road and easier to evolve. There is cost to doing this. For instance, extend-only design requires a lot more planning and enforcement from a CI-CD perspective than YOLO CRUD or whatever people do by default. So there is a cost to doing this, and that's the premium when it comes to options. But the value is you get that flexibility to evolve your system naturally in the future in a way that's going to be much less expensive and more importantly, much less risky than what you might be doing today. So just to recap, um, technical debt's the destruction of options. That's really what it is. When technical debt gets created, you're basically destroying a viable future option as a result of making a choice that is basically not flexible, is the idea behind it. Um, high optionality architectures, yeah, I just mentioned this, they tend to cost a bit more to develop up front. That is absolutely true. That is the trade-off, basically, that you're basically spending more time and money initially in your design, but they'll pay for themselves very quickly if your business evolves. And then on top of that, you know, really high optionality architectures are things you should do if you anticipate change being likely in your business. Over a long enough time horizon, change is inevitable. That will happen. But there are you know, cases where the application you're working on is probably pretty stable and the likelihood of it changing significantly is low. In those cases, you should feel free to use whatever you think is gonna be the most expedient to getting the job done. But most really critical business pieces of business software more than likely they're gonna change. And if you wanna enable your business to be agile and to be able to react quickly to those changes and you as a software developer, if you wanna be happy and not bitching about legacy code all the time, high optionality architecture is a really good investment. Um, and I would start by learning the event-driven part of it first is probably where I'd begin. Or if you wanna get started with something right away, think about freezing your schema and applying extend-only design to it. That's something you can do without re-architecting your software. So I'll start with that and think about changing how your CI, CD processes and your deployment systems might look if you did that. So uh, that's it for my talk today. Um, if you go to petabridge.com, you can see my original uh, sort of articles I wrote about high optionality architecture. And then uh, my handle is Aaron on the web. I tweeted out some links to all of my more detailed articles on things like extend only design. Uh, you can go ahead and find that on there as well. So thank you very much for your time and I'd be happy to take some questions. So you show of hands, yes. You talked about the, the CQRS uh, pattern. Yeah. And in Opera, there is something called uh, projections. Mm -hmm. Do you think of projections as a way to address that? Or Absolutely. So we use like Akadot Persistent, in, my, in our uh, system we use Akadot Persistence Query to do projections where essentially I have actors that tail the events that are being persisted into a materialized view. And how granular that view might be can re really kind of depends on the domain I'm working in. Um, I might do a per entity, let's say Akadot Persistence Query that spins up, uh, tails the events live as they come in, writes it all out into let's say a document or a set of SQL rows. And then if I make a really significant change to the way our view models work, I might go and introduce a totally new set of projection actors to do that. Any other questions? Yes. 
Yes. So the question, just to repeat it for everyone here, is how do you sell a upfront higher cost design methodology, like optionality to startups, the companies with the fewest resources and the greatest likelihood of change? Um, so I have made two really crucial mistakes with products I've owned where marked up was one of them, and I've got a second one uh, that we're currently still struggling with, actually, where we basically did a minimum viable product, so get something to market quickly that meets all the basic requirements of your customers, and we were a little bit too minimal and not enough viable, basically, was the, kind of the issue there. The argument you should make for high optionality architecture is that not doing this is betting against your success. That's the, the line you gotta say there. Look, if you think you're gonna be successful, build it like you mean it. If you don't think you're gonna be successful, why are you in this business? You know, go do web, you know, cryptocurrency or AI or something, right? <laughs> Next question. Pivot, oh yeah. Yeah, basically the, that's another good argument is that high optionality increases the likelihood of a successful pivot. You know, when you do make that transition from um, you know, N NFTs to AI tools, you know, that'll be really a, a really good selling point for that. Um, I, I hate that I keep knocking the startup industry. Those poor guys are having a rough time right now. Any other questions? Yes. So do we, um, okay, that's a good question. So with extend-only design is what you're referring to, right? So does extend-only design introduce technical debt? And my answer to that question is no, it doesn't. What it does leave behind is a lot of cellular waste some, to some extent, some old tables and old code that may not be used anymore. And once you're certain that that's not being used actively anywhere in your application, you can safely get rid of that stuff. It's just that the bet you're making is, you know what, in a large enough company with a large enough application with a lot of different services using it, the moment I deploy a new piece of schema, I am not 100% certain what all the interactions with that table or that API or that piece of data look like. So I'm going to make the bet that there are some systems out there still using it the old way. Therefore, I want to go ahead and take, eliminate the risk that that's going to cause a you know, category five shit storm inside our ops department that day, right? So the extend only design is basically a way of lowering the risk on a per deployment basis. Um, the one thing that extend only design will do is it'll force you to basically try to enforce some rules in your CI CD pipeline to eliminate really destructive actions. So I'll give you an example of how we do that in the Akadonet project. Um, we use a tool called a Verify, which is uh, basically a way of doing snapshot testing. And we do an entire printout of what our public API looks like. We render it as a giant string, basically. And that gets written to a text file that gets checked into source control. Verify will let us know if someone went through and let's say added a new argument to a constructor, that is actually technically a breaking change, right? Even if they made the argument optional. And that's because it's not binary compatible, and that means that every plugin built on older versions of Aka.net will break until it upgrades, which is something we, we explicitly do not allow in our versioning system, except under very special circumstances. Well, that allows us, so we basically have a habit as software developers of going and checking like, ah, nope, can't do that, not allowed to make that change uh, unless you do it in a way that's safe. And we have instructions written down on how to do that. You would need to check in a snapshot of something like your SQL schema, for instance to go and make sure, okay, this person did not drop the orders table by accident, or this person did not do whatever. Tools like an automatic entity framework code first migration should seem terrifying to you because you have no idea if you don't emit the output what it's really doing under the covers until it's starting to happen, right? So that's sort of one, something you're gonna have to incorporate into your build system a little bit. Uh, ditto with things like managing your wire format if you're using a tool like Aka.net or Kafka, where you're doing serialization of message types, that's another thing you'll want to check into source control and make sure there's a step where someone has to review that before it gets merged in. Uh, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, several times the uh, partitioning, like for actors and event processing. Yes. What do you mean by that? So what do I mean? The question was, when I talk about partitioning of events using actors, or really you could do it with any sort of anything like even a Kafka client can be partitioned. Uh, what does that mean? Partitioning means if you have a giant fire hose of events, 
rather than having a single class, basically responsible for processing all of them, you have the ability to basically divide that giant, let's say, fire hose of events into smaller streams that are organized by maybe the entity type or maybe by the entity ID itself. So let's, let's say if I have a thousand users on my website, I might partition the click stream for all 1,000 users into 1,000 little streams, one for each user. And Akka.net can route those messages to the single entity actor that owns that individual user. That's really what we mean by partitioning, is sort of breaking up the big stream into like manageable parts, essentially. Any other questions? Well, hey, thanks for the great questions, and thank you, everyone, for attending. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be around. I've got another talk on Friday morning on .NET Systems Programming, if you're interested. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.